Hi there, this tutorial is a follow on from the last one where I showed how to create a still version of this scene. And what I thought I'd do is show you how to convert that file into a file which works well in EV to make it more practical to animate. Because obviously with a lot of geometry in a scene, it can take quite a while to do a nice cycles version of the render, which makes it impractical, at least for the home user, to render that as an animation, unless you're prepared to leave your computer rendering for weeks at a time. So what I did was I converted the scene to EV and then animated it. And there are some compromises you need to make. So here is the animated version of the scene converted into EV. And you can see I animated some of the leaves. I also put a tiny bit of movement on some of the flowers just to give a subtle impression of air movement. And I'll take you through how to convert the scene that I showed in the previous video into this form. If you want the details of how to create the scene overall, go and look at that one. I'll leave a link to that in the descriptions below. So this is where we got to with the tutorial. I've not got all of the particles switched on here at the moment, just in order to keep the render times down. And this is the cycles preview render. So if we just come up to here and you can see we're in cycles mode right now. So I'm just going to switch that over to EV and you can immediately see it looks quite different. I haven't animated anything at the moment. So one of the first things we'll do is we'll animate the camera. But you can see there are some issues with some of the materials. They actually look basically how they look in the preview version. And the reason for that is because the EV engine is actually used for the preview in Blender now. So let's animate the camera first before we get into a few of the other details. So we'll do a very simple movement on the camera and I'll just stick with the standard 250 frames at the moment. So what we'll do is we'll simply add a curve which is a path there's the curve if we go into edit mode we can see which direction the curve is going in although it's possible to reverse that i'll turn it around something like that we'll go to preview mode so it's a bit more stable and we'll make it that size and we'll raise it up above the ground so roughly speaking we want the camera to start where it currently is we'll put that there and we'll put the end point somewhere like that and then we can just move these intermediate points to stretch. You can probably just make it out that black bezier curve into the path that we want to travel. And obviously you can have a more complex path than that if you want. So coming out of edit mode, we can select the camera. Now you can just group the camera with the curve and it will offer you the option to make it a path. But I prefer to do it this way, which is to go to camera constraints, add a constraint and select follow path. Select the NURBS path that you created. And usually it will go running off into the distance like that. Let's go back to the path, control A and apply all transforms. And now we can at least see our camera again. And I just bring the camera back in to roughly where it was. You may find it's moved vertically as well. So roughly speaking, our camera's in the right place now. And if I just click this button, it will animate the path. At the moment, nothing's happening, but click animate path. And now you can see the camera shoots through the path rather quickly. So if we have a look at what that's doing, there goes the camera and it finishes at about frame 100 and there's a good reason for that. So if we now select the path, go to the curves options and then under path animation, you can see it's only doing this over 100 frames. If I want the camera to travel this whole path or most of it across the length of my animation. Well, my animation is currently 250 frames, so I would need to put 250 frames there. Now, if I press play, you can see it's traveling a little more slowly. But obviously, anything I did, anything I rendered over here would be wasted because this is actually looking off the end of the animation at the moment. So in actual fact, I probably want to have the animation for the entire path to take more than 250 frames. So let's try 750 and that will actually slow it down quite a bit as well. So if we look through the camera now, that's a more reasonable rate of travel. It means that the camera won't reach the end of the path that it's been set before it reaches the end of the animation. And in this case, that's fine. So there's one other issue, and that is the camera's just looking off in one direction. If I select the camera, you can see it. It's not actually looking in the direction that it's traveling. So if we go to the constraints and we say follow curve, we may need to offset the direction of the camera slightly. So if I just rotate that. And now when we 
play, we can see that as the curve travels, as the path travels off in any given direction, the camera is looking in that direction. And we can give it a, an offset if we want to like that as well. I just rotated the camera on the z-axis there. So that's the simple beginnings of our animation. So the next thing we want to do is just adjust a couple of the materials. Now you may remember one of my little cheats is to add materials for all sorts of things to the ground because it just makes life easier when you want to get back to those materials. So here's the fern leaf for example and I've also got a material for the foxglove leaf of course and we'll bring that one up as well because both of those have got alpha textures and that's this black that we can see appearing. If I turn off the overlay. Obviously this black around the leaves is not supposed to be visible. So let's correct that to begin with. We'll start with the fern leaf. We'll go into EV preview mode and you can see our backgrounds come up there. For the moment I've hidden the mist layer because again that's another one we'll need to play with. So you can see we're getting some reflections on the leaves but we've still got that black visible. If we come down to settings in the material we have this blend mode and shadow mode change that to something other than opaque. I haven't found an awful lot of difference between them. So alpha clip will work and I believe that the shadow mode is whether the the shadow of the alpha version of the leaf is cast or the overall geometry. So we want that set to alpha as well. So you can now immediately see we've got the proper alpha leaves showing. So we'll just do the same for our foxgloves leaves. We're not showing our foxgloves at the moment. We'll just change those to alpha clip as well. That's fixed that element. Again, we can just animate that and you can see that's working. One little tip, by the way, you can see I've got an extra icon here that you don't get by default when you install Blender. You're able to turn these different icons on and off up here. So the default one you get is the little eye. So that's whether things are visible in the viewport. But one of the other ones that's quite useful and used to be in earlier versions of Blender is this one, which is a quick way to disable things in render. And you'll notice I've got something called cube. What I should have done is named it mist. So let's turn that on in viewport visibility. And you can see it's making the scene misty now and we'll turn it on in render as well. So we're getting some volumetrics instantly. So if we come around to here under render properties, go to volumetrics, you can see there is some default settings for it. So let's give that a quick render as it is. And we're now rendering in EV mode, of course, so it shouldn't take too long. So there we go. It took about 10 seconds, which isn't amazing, but I've got quite a lot of geometry in this scene with all those ferns. You can see the tops of some of my trees over there. And it's obviously added some of the post-processing that I did on there as well. So you can see that's a fairly reasonable scene. There is a bit of volumetrics in there, but it just needs a bit of improvement. So if we go to our mist, we can see our settings here and we may need to change the density. But let's put that up for a minute and you can see at point 0.1 it's a little too thick. So let's try point 0.01. Still pretty thick mist. But of course we can play with the anisotropy as well and there's a few other things we can play with too. So we'll go with point 0.005 for the moment. Then we'll come over to here, render settings, and then under volumetrics we'll have a look at this. So we can increase the accuracy or resolution if you like of the volumetrics here. Be careful because you can certainly send it so far that it's difficult for Blender to keep up. So if you go to four pixels, that will be a higher quality of volumetrics or mist and put the samples up as well. I went up to 128. In addition, if you want any possibility of God rays and things like that, you'll need to turn on volumetric shadows and I put the samples up to 32. Don't worry about light clamping. Whether you get any God rays will depend on how your lighting is set up and things like that. And you obviously need a fairly bright light source. You also need the angle of the light source to be quite small, which it is. So we can try turning that up and you may just be able to get a few God rays. As I say, it depends on the scene overall. I think we'll turn that down slightly. And as I said, you can play with the anisotropy just to get what effect you want. And that just affects how the light shines through it. So that's volumetrics tweaked. And then the last thing is to add a little bit of animation to the leaves. So we'll come out of the rendered version and come over to here to our plants. So I'll do it to the fern plant. This is where it becomes extra important that you have multiple versions of the fern plants or any other plants that you're going to replicate many times. So I'm going to just duplicate these because we don't want every plant doing the same thing at the same time because by animating these, their duplicates over here will animate. 
And obviously what we don't want to have to do is to create an animation keyframe throughout our entire animation. We want to do things a little more easily than that. So what I did was use shape keys. So if you click here under object data properties with one of your ferns selected and then click here to click the plus and that creates as it were the starting point or basis as it's called of the shape, the animated shape of our object. Then click it again and you get the first key or the first option for changing the shape. We don't actually need more than one. We'll now go into edit mode. We'll turn on proportional editing. So you can see that's turned on there. I'll just select a vertex and then we'll go around moving some of the leaves. I'm going to say GX and just pull part of that leaf down a little bit. GX and perhaps bring that one up and that way ever so slightly. I'm only looking in my case for relatively small movement. So a little bit of subtle movement just to give the idea that there's a little bit of airflow. And obviously the shorter the leaves, the less they're likely to move. So we've modified the shape very slightly. If I come out of edit mode now, under here with the key one selected, if I turn the value up, you can see that moves us towards that edited version of the shape. But you'll notice we've got a range min and max and currently the max is one and the minimum is zero. We set the minimum to minus one and then adjust this. You notice we can now go the other way. So it's inverting, as it were, the change that we made. And if we decide we actually were a bit too subtle with our change, we could go to minus 1.2 and plus 1.2. So that will actually distort our model even more than we did when we edited it. So this is a very crude, but you may also be able to see in the background there if I zoom in here, as I'm changing this, the leaves are actually moving over here. So I'm going to set that to zero. I'm going to make sure I'm at the beginning of the animation and then I'm going to press I just to keyframe that and immediately come up here and go to the graph editor. Press N to bring up this right hand menu and then click modifiers, add a modifier, which is a noise modifier. And if we just press play now, you can see that's a bit high frequency. It's wobbling around much too much, but you can see what it's done. That's what it's wobbling to. So first of all, under scale, let's make that much larger. We're currently running at somewhere around 25 ish frames per second. So that's something comparable with the animation. I normally run my animations at 25 frames a second. Perhaps we go to 15 for the scale. And now the strength, perhaps that's a bit too much. We'll go to 0.5. And you can see there's a little bit of subtle movement. You need to obviously have multiple versions of these plants and do this to each of them. And then each one will have a slightly different animation. But that's it. Once you've done that, the equivalent plants in your scene will be moving. Now, obviously, I've only animated one plant at the moment, which is why many of them, because I created duplicates, are not actually animating at the moment. But you can see this one's leaf just here is animating. And you can do the same thing with the foxglove, what I did was create a shape key that just moved the flower left and right a little bit and very little else. And then that just gave you the idea that it was just moving around, waving slightly in the wind. So finally, a few little settings that you may want to adjust. Bloom is a common one to use. So obviously that gives you this sort of glow halo around things. I wouldn't overuse it though. Keep the intensity down quite a bit and the radius down as well. So it just gives you a subtle effect. Something else that will, is worth using is screen space reflections. Obviously, each of these things is going to slow your animation a little bit, slow the time it takes to render an, a frame, but it just adds to the quality and you're still having a much quicker render time than you would have in cycles. So if I turn that off, you can see what we've got. I'll try and zoom in on an area where there's some shininess. And then we turn this on and you can see we get nicer variations within the scene, a little bit closer to what we had with the cycle scene. I didn't change any of the defaults in there. It wasn't necessary. The only thing you might want to change under shadows is to turn on soft shadows, which is basically where there's multiple light sources. And it simulates the idea of having, for example, like over here, a soft light. And therefore you have soft shadows rather than very hard shadows. You can also bake indirect lighting if there isn't very much changing for the lighting. So you can click here to bake the indirect lighting. 
it's not always going to be successful, especially if you have things moving in the scene where the lighting will change. But if not, then that will also help with the render time because it will already be baked. And you can do a few other little tricks like putting light probes in there, but we're not going to get into that. And that's all there is to it. I said this would be a short tutorial, so I hope you found that interesting. And if you did, let me know and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.